Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Smite. In this particular episode, I'm going to focus a little less on my gameplay and talk more about the new changes to Conquest that have happened in Smite. So, in this particular episode, there will be two periods at which there are longer than average pauses while I talk about some of these Conquest changes. One will be very early on, and I will be referencing that change throughout the match very specifically. I am playing solo lane in this match for a specific reason, okay? This was not a random position that I chose to play here. But, secondarily, somewhere about, I want to say, a third of the way through, I'm going to be pausing for an extended time again to talk about Stygian Beacons, the second big change to Conquest, okay? However... I will still be constructing this pretty similarly to my usual Conquest videos. So, really quickly, let's talk about approaching this from the solo lane, which is obviously what I'm playing as Guan Yu. I am not a support Guan, which is normally where I play him. I am playing solo lane Guan Yu here. Now, the enemy team composition really isn't that unusual. Oh, really quick moment, by the way. I apologize if I sound a little off. I just got over a cold, and this is the leftover... Uh, I guess, mucus that my body is just holding on to for fun time's sake. <clears throat> Anyways, the only real question that I have as a solo laner approaching this enemy team composition is which one of these two assassins is going to be the solo lane? Now, my bet, correctly in this case, is on Ravon. However, be aware of the fact that both Fenrir and Ravon play both jungle and solo lane quite well, so while I was personally betting Ravon and I was correct here, it was just as possible that Fenrir would have been in the solo lane and could have been quite a challenging opponent. His brutalizability is very difficult to deal with in the early game of a solo lane. Alright, with that being said, let's pop ahead. Now, I... oh, it's having a bit of an issue here, there we go. Now, prior to this, I had asked if the team wanted me to pull blue to the experience camp because they hadn't taken up their positions. Now, pretty shortly, I'm going to reiterate this, but you can actually see, I'm going to ask again, I put the question mark to remind it, <clears throat> think about asking a second time, I see the Ratatosk gear moving to the right jungle and Scylla moving left. Now, this indicates, generally speaking, the standard. I'm double-checking here, but with Scylla at speed positioned on the left side and Ratatosk gear at the right speed, the usual assumption, and if you're a solo lane player, this is usually the assumption you're going to go with, you will be pulling blue to the experience camp, and you in the mid will be clearing all three of those. You'll be splitting the two, because this ensures that both of you hit level two before you reach your lanes. And this is pretty important, as you will see, because the enemy Ravon does not do this, and you'll be able to see this in a bit. Now, the reason why I ask is because even though this is generally, at least with the allied jungle in the right speed, the reason why this is something I double-checked is because not everyone is on board with this yet. Right, so I'd like to double check at least at this point, and you will see the Ravon again is a great example of why it's worth double checking. Ravon comes in at level one, so he has not done this either that or they goofed that. But considering he got there a little bit earlier, I would have to say probably he soloed his blue or didn't pull it correctly. So the Ratatosk here, by the way, comes over. I actually want to really specifically talk about the Ratatosk Gear's pathing path here, because he clears damage with Scylla, grabs this, right, comes over here, he's just coming over here to visit. Now, it's interesting to know that the Fenrir was in mid lane, didn't see Ratatosk Gear here, and you know he's moving over here. I registered this, right, so Ratatosk Gear goes on to the Ravon, I come in for the attack, right, but I'm a little late. I get some poke in here, but I don't want to press too hard, because I knew Fenrir was coming in, and Lo and behold, here's Fenrir. So I'm backing up at this point, right? Ratatosk gear is healthier than Fenrir is. We get some good damage in here. I accidentally take too much damage from the tower. I actually misjudge this very slightly. You can see this. I, I do die from this. I didn't need to go with the full 30 seconds. Oops. The whole 20 seconds back. Hold on. 
So I want you to see this, because this is pretty important. <clears throat> I barely miss this. And then I dash. You can see where I am just barely over that. I had backed up a step, but I was just barely over that. And that hits me really hard. If I had actually done that correctly, I wouldn't have been hit by that tower, and I wouldn't have died here. Right, so this puts me a little bit behind. Alright, just right off the top. But it's still fairly early in the game. It's not really a problem. I accidentally sell my shield for some reason. I get my level 2 shield, I teleport back in. Fenrir has stayed quite a decent amount of time there, right? Probably because they killed Ratatos here, so he's feeling pretty confident at this particular point in time. I increase my third ability, which you can't quite see yet because the... There we go. <clears throat> well, there it was. Now, the Fenrir commits a little too hard. I Remember, I've come back fresh and I've just upgraded my shield, so he really shouldn't be dedicating this. The fact that he basically stayed around too long and let me kill him puts me in a really strong position. There's actually two mistakes going on here that I really quickly want to talk about with the Fenrir. The Fenrir's first mistake was staying too long in lane. He was splitting that experience with Ravon. Ravon just now has hit level 3. I'm already almost at level 4. Okay? The reason for this is, despite the fact that Ravon killed me, and also probably got an assist off of the Ratatos gear, Fenrir split several waves. If we go back up for a little bit here, because this is something a lot of people don't think about, so I really want to emphasize this, right? Fenrir's still here. He's clearing waves. Ravon went back even. Okay? <coughs> So Ravon went back at level 2, Fenrir cleared part of the wave, or the remainder of the wave, so Ravon missed out on that. Here's Fenrir staying up here, right? Fenrir decides to attack me. I'm not sure what possessed him to do this, because that was clearly a bad idea, given that there were still minions. I was fresh. I had just purchased my upgraded item. Ravon just now hits level 3. I'm borderline level 4 right here. I back up a little bit, because I want my minions to cover for me while I get to level 4, right? And then here we go. Boom. Level 4. Now I'm operating at a decent damage advantage over Ravon, and he knows that he's playing this safe for a reason. I'm going hard on this because I'm Guan Yu. My Taolu Assault is giving me a huge advantage that Ravon just cannot match at this point in time. I'm killing these ghosts for golden experience, which is great for me. Actually, this is really significant. This is a really great thing for me in general, right? This is absolutely an ideal circumstance for solo lane. This is tilting this lane in my favor. Yeah, I died first and Ravon hasn't died, and in fact, I even died to Ravon, but the fact that Fenrir basically sacrificed himself to me and I'm getting these ghosts, and Ravon let Fenrir finish a wave and start another one without him gives me a substantial golden experience advantage over Ravon that he's going to have a really hard time keeping up with because, again, Talu Assault is very strong as an ability. I clear the totem for the mana here, which keeps me in lane. You can see the Ravon is out of mana. He clearly hasn't purchased mana potions. Off he goes to get his mana buff, because I'm assuming it's up at this time. Mine is, so I'm assuming his is as well. I go ahead and clear the wave because I'm still regenerating a certain amount of mana left over from the uh, totem. Here's Fenrir jumping on me. I'm not that concerned because here is my ult. Obviously, I had my ult up that was going to keep me alive. I knew Fenrir was coming, actually, and you can see that it was just a little bit before this. You can actually see Fenrir <coughs> leaving mid lane, and this is where I want to talk about the mid lane adjustment. Mid lane is a little wider. You can see it's not massively wider, right? I think Fenrir actually left the lane even earlier than this, but where did Fenrir leave that mid lane? There he goes. He's right there. Right as I'm starting this totem, I know Fenrir is hanging around this jungle here. Now I have the we have the ward here as a, as a team, so I'll know if he's going for my blue buff. He doesn't wind up going for my blue buff. I assume he's clearing his side of the jungle over here, and he just looped his way up this way. But I know he's in this left jungle, and I know it'll take him a little less time than what you might be used to, because this mid lane sticks out a little more towards the solo lane, and lo and behold, here he is. The only reason I stayed up as far as I did and as aggressively as I did is because I did have my ult, so I knew that even if Fenrir was to get his ult during that time, I would be totally fine, right? I also have the advantage of regenerating my mana from the totem here. You can see where I'm getting that benefit due to the line there, but this is... Not necessarily as bad a position for me as you would think. Yeah, I'm low on health, but I have the mana where I can clear this out. Here's Ravon. 
Here's Fenrir blinking on me, and you'll hear, if you pay attention, you can hear where I hit him with an auto attack. I don't mind dying here because I took Fenrir with me. Yes, again, I do get killed by Ravon. Ratatoskir apologizes, so I tell him, use the time, right? I killed Fenrir, so this gives Ratatoskir some bonus time. This becomes pretty important later. I'll talk about that why, right? For now, earmark the fact that I've taken Fenrir with me, and this is his second tumble, okay? Because this will become significant. Now, you can see... Ratatoskir absolutely uses the time, and shout out to the Ratatoskir here, he was actually a really great jungler. Watch once I get out of the inventory screen here. They're fighting the Scylla here. I don't know how this, the enemy Scylla got here, but the dedication is absolutely what we need. Now, they can do this, they can get away with this, because the Fenrir died. The Fenrir, at this point, was likely looking for farm. This is, again, the second time he's died to me, ironically. He's going to be looking for that farm, right? He wasn't going to be there, or he was less... Well, let me actually phrase this more accurately. He was less likely to be there because he had died to me earlier. This isn't the huge difference here. This isn't the hugely important thing, but it is a significant factor. In fact, he comes in from the right jungle. You can see where he was in right jungle, and now he's covering mid lane for the Scylla, which is part of his actual job as jungle, right? His mid lane died, so he covers the mid lane. That's part of what a jungler does, which is fine. Ravon is missing, wherever he's gone, but that's fine, I get to farm. Now you'll notice that despite the fact that Ravon has killed me both times, both of my deaths have been to Ravon, I'm still ahead of him. Again, this is partially because I've been killing the Fenrir, and partially because of the experience and gold I got from that Soul Surge earlier, which is, again, a great benefit to me. Now, the Ravon gets a bit uppity here. He goes after me, which is really interesting, considering that in terms of early game abilities, I have a bit of an advantage here with Talu Assault. He mistimes his ult, which was a huge problem for him. I get a nice stun on him. I get some bonus damage. I get another Talu Assault on him, right? I'm running my multi-potions to help keep myself alive, keep myself in mana. He tries to poke me without an ability. I get some free poke on him instead, and I get to absolutely just poke him out, keep him under tower. He's just trying to keep up with me in terms of golden experience. That's what he's looking for now. I do a nifty little combo usage there. I decide not to go for it the second time because, quite frankly, at this point, I just really want the mana. And Ron, I thought, was coming up, so I wanted to lure him in. He didn't, so it was a bit of a mistake on my part. I should have done the same thing twice. But he's out of mana now, I've poked him a decent bit, but now he's out of mana and I can go on ahead and work on this Bastion, which I do want to do, right? And here he is, poke him a little bit more, I want to keep him low, I want to keep him thinking, I want to keep him nervous. I see that the Fenrir is in right jungle, so I'm not worried about getting ganked. What I want to do is make sure that while they're all busy in right jungle, I'm actually doing something useful. So I'm looking to take this Bastion, I miss an auto attack there somehow, keep pressuring him, work on the other Bastion a little bit, come back to this one, right? That's all I'm trying to do. Right now, I'm denying him gold by forcing the minions to get shot by the tower, because a single tower shot reduces the amount of gold that minion gives you. Way back in the old days, it used to completely nullify all gold that that minion would give you. Obviously, he's low and has no mana, so I ult in, right? He, if he's got low health, no mana, absolutely, why wouldn't you ult him, right? Easy decision. Get a nice kill there. Cements my lead. And I know at this point, I actually make a mistake with my itemization in response to this. I don't respond to this correctly in terms of my itemization a little bit later on, but Ratatoskir calls me back for the mana buff, so I grab the totem, and I'm going to move back for the mana buff, and this is a mistake on my part. I didn't think he was going to go around for the experience buff. He does. It's fine. It's a mild hiccup at best, but here we are. I've got my mana buff. I've got the cooldown buff. Here is, of course, Fenrir, right? Not really terribly surprised. Here's Ravon. Again, not really surprised. Okay. Radis Oscar says, be careful. I say no. I was joking around, but I think he took that as me asking to attack. I get ulted by Fenrir, which is fine. Right? I come out of that. And they're really trying to kill me. Now, the Fenrir really wants me dead because I'm very ahead of the Ravon, right? I kill him, and I come back into the Soul Surge because what I want to do is at least die in the Soul Surge. I wasn't terribly likely to get away from the Ravon, right? 
Now you can see here, actually this is where I make my mistake, hold on a second. I'm contemplating dual protections. I'm trying to decide what I want to build. I almost build some magic protections, but then I make the mistake of going for th more physical protections. Alright. <clears throat> now the reason why that's a mistake is because I'm very ahead at this point in time. Yes, Ravon has caught up to me since killing the... Ratatosk gear, and this is what prompts me to go into the physical protections and upgrade my teleport once more, right? I have actually maxed my teleport because that's going to give me some more options. The reason why it's a mistake is because with the mid lane as it is and the Stygian beacon being a new thing that we will be fighting for in the near future, I should have built at least some form of magic protections. I've, in fact, broken from my usual habit of building dual protections as my third item, which is normally what I do, but I decided to invest more heavily in the physical protections. And this, while it doesn't hurt me that much in the long run, there is a noticeable difference, okay? We'll talk about that when it comes down to it, but note that I've made the mistake of focusing in too much on physical protections. This is something that the enemy Asilla should take advantage of, ultimately doesn't, right? Oh, by the way, I dove the tower to make sure that Ratatosk gear, with, who has less protections, doesn't take too many shots from the tower, right? He smacks down the Ravon, which is what I needed. Puts me back ahead, right? I hit level 11, he's still level 10, so that puts me in the lead again, which is what we want, because, again, pretty soon that beacon's gonna be coming up. <coughs> so, I grab my cooldown, I want mana, right? They're still killing people in mid, right? It was kind of a trade, actually, which is fine. I'm just trying to do my farm here, which is absolutely what we need. You can see the cooldown for the Stygian Beacon right there, right? It's, it's counting down to when that spawns, so I'm going to want to be ready for that. And I'm going to go for my blue buff. Ravon has just respawned. I assume he's going to wipe out the waves. This is fine. What I want to do, and there he is... What I want to do is have my blue buff before I go back, because you can see my teleport just came back. I just want to make sure that while I'm back in Fountain, he's not stealing my blue buff, right? So I go on ahead, and I want the Mystical Mail. I wait for this, because I just used my teleport, for Pete's sakes, or I'm going to use my teleport. I see Ravon is missing in the middle, so I go on ahead and teleport to the mid area, because, of course, again, that beacon is coming up, right? You can actually see the countdown timer there. <clears throat> and here comes, you know, we're, we're fighting in mid. Now, the reason I specifically... All right, there's a couple of things here going on. Let's actually come back to the teleport. I buy the mystical mail. I teleport here. First off, you can see the countdown timer here, right? You can see that this matches this here. These are the three beacons. This is when this lights up and the beacon is actually present, okay? So you can see here, but what... I'm teleporting here for is two reasons. I'm teleporting here. One, you can see Ravon here, right? He pinged the ward just before I teleported. That's why I teleported here. Or one of the reasons why I teleported here, too. He's rotating over because what he wants to do is help his team win this mid lane fight so they can take the Stygian Beacon. The Stygian Beacon increases your damage against structures. It increases your team's movement speed by 1%. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you get all three, that turns out to be a 3% total movement speed buff. And if once the three, once all three Stygian Beacons have been claimed by one team or another, the two Titans leave and they start fighting in whatever lane has the most towers. I believe it's the most towers. That doesn't happen this game because we start curb stomping them at the, from this point forward. The reason why we'll talk about in a, at the end of the match... But we really turn this around. I mean, we're already ahead. We are we already have a decent lead. We have five kills more. We've got 2,200 more gold, roughly speaking. So we have a decent lead, but we really begin to snowball at this point. All right, this is where we start to really exceed and start to really dominate. All right, so they surrender before we get to the third beacon. Now... I teleport not only to intercept the Ravon, that's one of the reasons why, but also because I want to be here anyways. The beacon is coming up, and while I may or may not need to be here to get the beacon, in fact, for a brief moment I leave because I don't think I'm needed here anymore, I come back because they put up a second attack on it. All right, you'll see that in a bit, but I'm here primarily to intercept the Ravon's intended gank, 
which he ran because, again, mid lane is a little bit closer to solo lane than it used to be, so he ran that, quite rightfully so. He's no As an assassin, he's no slouch on the move speed. But secondarily, I want to make sure my team has the opening they need to take the beacon. Alright, so that's why I'm here. I discover this deliciously low-leveled Ymir, so we go on him. Bacchus is right here with me. By the way, shout out to the Bacchus. He was another amazing player in this. Reditoskir and the Bacchus were fantastic, at least from what I was able to see in this match. So we wipe out these two, the Fenrir and the Ymir. I'm trying to poke out the Ravon. He gets away using his ult. I'm not really looking to dedicate too much time here, but I see that our Apollo dies, and that sets off a little bit of a red flag where I'm a little bit cautious here. You see me take the Bastion, and then I'm going to leave, because I'm like, all right, so we have all of this down, that's fine. Ravon follows me, so I go on ahead and I attack him, because the Sill is there, right? And it occurs to me at approximately this point that Fenrir could be coming in, but I see Ratatoskir coming in, I see Scylla coming in, I see Bacchus, so I keep on going, right? If Fenrir had been a little bit earlier, I might have been in trouble, but we take out the Ravon, which is great for us. Right, and then I'm looking to disengage, because I don't think we should be fighting them too hard or too long on their side of the jungle. That generally doesn't end well, okay? I'm just clearing out jungle stuff. Gonna take his blue buff. The enemy team is on the beacon. You can see them being on the beacon. You can see where the beacon is being taken by them. They're the chaos team, so that orange is how much they own, and the blue is how much we own, right? They're fighting there. Ratatoskir kills Fenrir over this buff, which is great, so I think to myself, hey, alright, I'm gonna go and take this tower while they take the beacon. Right, we're winning this, technically speaking. We have Bacchus, and the, we have the mid and the support fighting there, right? But then this is taking a while, and I'm, I'm doing this totem, and I'm like, well, let me, let me do this totem and see if this is gonna give them the edge they need. Okay, but then they really start taking it, so then we have a bit of a problem. So I'm on my way now at this point because now I'm getting concerned. We should have taken this and now we're losing this. What happened, right? We won the previous team fight. So I'm coming in on this. And you can see the Emir trying to just stand on it just to keep that maintained. I scare off the Scylla. Ratatoskir does a better job of that than I think I would ever did. I think she just saw me first because Ratatoskir was in the air. Right, I killed the Emir because he retreated because he was dying. And then... Fortunately, the Scylla was the one, I believe it was the Scylla who took the uh, beacon. The Scotty arrives to Actually, we can see this. Let me go back a little bit because the Scotty is a really fun time. Now, I'm coming in. You can see Ratatoskir ulting here. I don't think she sees him because he's right up here at the time. She sees, I think, me. I, I should, probably shouldn't have approached her with Ratatoskir in the air. The Ymir backs out because he's probably seen. Right? There we go. <clears throat> so we have this fight here, right? We have Scylla, we have Bacchus, we have Ravon and Ymir on this as the two tankier people they're supposed to be, right? Scylla gets attacked, the Ymir starts running. I think he was trying to get behind the Bacchus, I think. So we take him out, and then here is... You know, Scylla taking that, just to go back really quick to confirm. It was actually Bacchus and Scylla together. Alright, they take that... I've actually, I I'm, think I'm incorrect. I think... No, there it is. It is the blue. We are the blue. I thought so. So then, we take out the Ravon, and then Scotty is here. Now, normally this would be a problem, right? Normally, a rotating hunter... Rotating so early would be an issue, but Apollo has a global ult, so I'm not personally concerned about it. I'm willing to press the attack, despite the fact I'm low, I'm low health. There's the Apollo. He's coming in hot. Takes out the Scotty takes out the Fenrir, great gameplay by the Apollo, really great awareness, he took advantage of the Scotty rotating to both take our tower, and because he had the global ult, he was able to rotate in time to help us out, we take the tower, it was, it was a really great strategic decision by the Apollo, great amount of trust he had in us as a team, it was just absolutely great awareness by the Apollo, so quick shout out to the Apollo here for great decision making, I go back to my lane because I really want to just take this damn tower at this point, it's got almost no health, I was actually kind of expecting it to be taken beforehand, but you can see where, if we hadn't taken out the Scylla before, and even in the earlier fight, the first fight that I teleported in for, where I took a bit more damage than maybe one would like from, say, a Guardian or from the Scylla. So, at this point, I'm making the mental note, alright, we're starting to actually fight more consistently in the mid lane, 
I really need to pick up more serious magic protections, obviously. Again, it was a mistake. I should have focused on some sort of dual protection. I should have grabbed Pridwin, in all honesty. Get 30% cooldowns, get that shield going. That would have been a really great choice for me here. Again, I picked up Mystical Mail. Not a bad choice, but I think it was just too early. This was me being interrupted by a family member. Not their fault. So I got a retreat, right? Not because the family member interrupted me, but because I'm out of mana and I was going to go back anyways. So, here we are, back at Fountain. I'm not too concerned about my left lane at this particular point in time. I grabbed some specifically magic protections. At this point, it's a little later than I would like to normally build my dual protections. I need some dedicated hardcore magic protections. I need some cooldowns. And Genji's Guard is great for that, right? To sort of compensate for the fact that I didn't build it earlier. So, I'm teleporting here. I was originally just going to run back to my lane and then teleport over once I cleared that tower, but I saw Ravon leaving. See, you can actually see my thought process change as soon. See, what I'm going to do here, just to pause it really quick, I see Ravon here, so what I was going to do is run to this lane, clear a wave, and maybe chase off Ravon, or just dive the tower and take out the tower myself, and then teleport to one of these two wards. That was my original plan. That's why I didn't teleport to left lane originally. But then Ravon disappears. And I'm like, oh, he's rotating to mid. So I teleport in, and I turned out to be correct. Right, because obviously Scylla and Bacchus are really deep. Here's Ravon. I was expecting Ravon to come from behind, which is why I was pathing the way I was. I was wrong on that one. But I was correct that he was rotating. And of course, I'm three levels higher than him at this point, so I have no fear. Ratatoskir is ulted. I have my ult. I am willing to go whole hog in here, right? This poor Ymir is very underleveled at this point. He just now hit level 11. He's still two levels down. We absolutely slaughter this poor guy. Scare off the Ravon. Apollo wins a great fight with Scotty, so I now no longer have to worry about her, right? That's great for me. Bacchus is going in a little bit on this Scylla. Our Scylla is picking up what Bacchus and I are laying down, which is great. I stay too long in a tower, though. I dive too deep on this. I don't respect the Ravon enough, you can actually see this. I go pretty hard on this. I keep on going a little bit. I really should not have. Even though the Ravon is three levels down, I am under the tier two tower. I really should have left slightly earlier. Now, at this point, I'm desperately trying to save Scylla. I fail, but at least we can avenge her. Between Bacchus, Ratatoskr, and I, that's not really a huge issue. But now I'm going to go back to mid lane, because at this particular point, we are very ahead of them in terms of golden experience. And I want to just take this tower. I know Ravon either... I can't see Ravon in mid lane, so he's either in mid lane just farther back, or he went back to fountain. Either way, this thing only has 4 HP. Boom. There it is. Right, now I'm going to go for this totem, just so that way I can get that for my team before I go back, because I'm looking to go back. My teleport is about up, so while I'm waiting for those last 10 seconds, grab this for my team, so that way if Ravon comes back to lane, he can't steal this. I'm going to be looking to get the cooldown buff as well for the exact same reason, right? <clears throat> I take out the wave. Mostly, I take out the wave here because Ratatoskr is right there, and I want to be available in case he needs help, right? Ratatoskr calls out for a gank, so I don't know what he's thinking. He's not doing anything, so I come back to the cooldown, right? And then he starts fighting Ravon. So I drop the cooldown buff, and I go help him out with Ravon, who has lost his mana from somewhere. I... I think he actually just was clearing the jungle. I don't think he went back to Fountain. I think he was clearing the jungle for experience. Here's a surprise Fenrir. You can see me having a heart attack, by the way. You can actually see the moment I had a heart attack. Oop, that was a little too far, but... So we're fighting the Ravon, who, again, I think was farming the jungle. Which is why, uh, Ratatoskir might have been having a uh, Ratatoskir, Fenrir might have been having a little trouble. And then here's... Fenrir, you can see me turn jankily towards him because I had a heart attack. I was not expecting him to be there, but we dedicate. And now, I'm willing to die for this because at this particular point, I know Ravon has no mana, and I was kind of hoping that the Ratatoskir would be high enough strength to take that out, but unfortunately, he isn't. Right, he does stay around there. You can see him on the new map, but I'm too busy trying to figure out what the hell is going on in mid lane. <coughs> because Bacchus is just obviously defending that lane. They back off for some reason, which is really interesting. You can see they backed off because they are not fighting at that wave. You can see it right there. The minions have met in mid, and they are not being attacked by any gods. So for some reason, the enemy team backed off of mid lane, which is why Bacchus backed in the first place. Ratatoska was unfortunately not able to pick up Ravon. I increased my blink. I'm not sure why I should have increased my cloak. 
I was distracted slightly at this time by family member, but that's fine. But back I go to left lane. Same idea. I'm just looking to farm the jungle and stuff. I'm leaving my teleport up because if my team needs me somewhere, I want to be able to teleport to that area pretty damn quick. So I haven't used it to return to the solo lane. Solo lane was not under pressure. This beacon is coming up, obviously. I wanted to have my teleport be available in case my team needed it. So that's why I didn't use it to return to left lane. There are more important things for me right now to worry about. So I grab my blue buff. I see the Fenrir. I see the Ymir kicking around mid. So I'm rotating over because I'm just assuming Ravana is going to go over there, right? The enemy team is behind. They are going to be really desperate for this particular beacon. So here we are. Bacchus goes in as he should. I start going after the enemy Ymir because I can reduce his protections and lay on the hurt. I see my team is on the beacon. I'm looking to just distract them. I ult purely to distract them. The Fenrir lurking behind me with his ult and being unable to hit me with it is a bonus. Scylla comes in just the right time, picks that up. Almost picks up the Ymir. I think she was robbed, personally. Uh, but I'm just looking to kill people. I have my blink up. Boom. Slap. Take out the two. Apollo was there to pick it up if I missed it, which is great. Right, we are able to extract back out of there. Vaughn leaves. Scotty is trying to keep us from taking the Phoenix that we don't care about. We want this tower. And we can freely take this because we just got our second beacon, so we're going to be absolutely tearing through this thing, which is great for us. Right? We really like this. And off we go. Stealing their farm, which is good. Right? This is what we want. They are going after the Pyromancers, so I'm just on my way here <coughs> obviously right at this point it's pretty confident that we have this in the bag now somebody calls out take this jungle buff I didn't understand that this was the Bacchus saying this I wasn't paying enough attention I should have taken that bomb the f the pyromancer bomb as a frontliner one of the f two frontlines should take the bomb because they go right up to the phoenix right I should have taken that I see Ratatoskir getting attacked by Ravon at this point. I didn't think that Ravon was dedicated. See, you can, you can actually see this. You can see this here. I see this here. I wasn't expecting the Ravon to sustain an attack. I thought it was just a poking attempt until it lasted too long for a poking attempt. It lasted like 10 seconds. And I'm like, nah, this isn't a poke. This is Ravon initiating. So I go in on that, right? I, after realizing that it is not the poke I assumed it was. We take him out. Which surprises me because he initiated like he was expecting reinforcements, and here's Fenrir, way too late to be considered reinforcements. So I have no idea what Ravon was thinking at that particular time, why he was doing a sustained attack on Ratatoskir. Like I said, some poke would have been fairly understandable. We catch Scotty here for some reason. Fenrir grabs me, I'm not sure. I think he was actually after Ratatoskir, to be honest, and he just grabbed me by accident. But here we are, of course my bluestone gets me in trouble again. It happens. So, Ratatoskir and I are going for the Phoenix. Now, normally this wouldn't be a great idea, but we have two Stygian Beacons, so we're doing quite a bit of bonus damage here. Right, I barely don't make it out of the Phoenix in time, which is fine. Uh, we get the Phoenix, I get my Mantle of Discord, so I have a nice bonus to my protections at this point. They do take the Phoenix, and they ki well, Apollo kills Solo, which is absolutely fantastic. And as much as Ravon is trying to put pressure on, at this point he's surrounded, and... I mean, Apollo is back there with Ymir. Uh, Ymir, four levels lower than the Apollo. Yeah, the Apollo isn't in great health, but this is Hunter versus a four levels lower Guardian. Let's be really honest. That's not a fight that Ymir was going to win anytime soon. Right, they take out the Ymir. And they're moving on to the Scotty. The Ratatoskir makes a pretty bold move, but realizes he can't grab that. So he extracts. They're trying to get some poke in. This is poke right here. Well, the Ratatoskir was laughing, but I mean, at this point... So they retreat, and I'm I'm trying to get them to place a ward for teleport. They don't have wards. I don't buy one either, so I'm just as guilty of this. All right, don't. And they do put one down just a second later. All right, so they're actually better at warding than I am here. So Scylla is getting pressured by Fenrir. I'm watching this. I see the Scotty start to come in, but she's got Bacchus with her, and she's really high in level compared to them, so I'm watching this carefully, right? The Silva seems to be getting away, but we've got Bacchus here, right? But they, there they are, they're fine, right? They got out just fine. I hit level 20, which is what I wanted. I'm going to work on my blue buff, and I'm going to assess the situation. I want to see what the enemy team is doing. They're going to be, as you can see, Ravon is paying particular attention to left lane because there's fire minions barreling down that lane. 
does not surprise me. That's pretty normal. I see Scotty, I see Scylla, and I see Fenrir in the left jungle. I'm going to take the cooldown buff just to see what happens. They shouldn't really need me there, right? I say on my way, <coughs> grab my cooldown buff, and now I'm on my way. Because it looks like they were getting a little bit slapped around. Scylla, in fact, almost dies. But that's fine. I get frozen by Amir just as I was about to blink, which is deeply unfortunate. But here I go. I blink in. I know his freeze is down. Here's the Paula, which is great. I'm going to go whole hog on this Scotty. Right there she goes. Apollo picks that up, which is great. We have the Soul Surge, so we can, you know, really lay on the hurt right now. You notice that when the Soul Surge appears, the rev the, the Red Toss Gear comes in, right? I want to take out this uh, Ravon because he's one of the bigger threats on their team, since he's one of the few that's actually closer to our level, right? We eventually take him out, which is fantastic. Now we can press for mid lane, which is exactly what we need right now. We can take that mid Phoenix, right? I'm going to try to pressure the Scylla out of here. While the Apollo hopefully takes the Phoenix. Here's Bacchus right here with me, which is exactly what we need, right? The Fenrir is trying to pressure me. Scylla, for some reason, began taking the Phoenix damage. Not sure why it focused on her and not Bacchus, but these are mysteries we'll never have answered. So we go on ahead and take out the Fenrir more because the opportunity was given to us, right? Apollo goes pretty hard on Scylla. I'm just trying to give him the time he needs to take that Phoenix. That's all I'm doing here, right? We happened to take out the enemy Scylla. That wasn't really the intention here. I'm keeping on going because here's Apollo. He's going hard on this, right? We've got Bacchus. I'm about to die to the Titan, of course, but at this particular point in time, I'm not expecting this to be the final push. They actually surrender pretty close to this point here. They surrender right there. That wasn't going to be our win. We needed the other Phoenix. We needed the tower. We weren't going to win this here because we didn't have the resources. I was almost dead. Bacchus had no mana. We would have had to have done another push, but we were far enough ahead where that was almost a sure thing, so I can understand why they surrendered at that particular point. Okay? But now, at this particular point, I want to talk about why I like the Stygian Beacon. Alright, because I'm very fond of the Stygian Beacon. The reason why I'm very fond of the Stygian Beacon is because, and I don't think I, I did not go for the, yeah, I did not go for the, uh, I forgot to, I forgot to bring up the scoreboard at the end, which is unfortunate, but what I do want to talk about, since the main point here was to talk about the changes to Conquest, talk about the shift in the mid lane and the Stygian Beacon. I like the Stygian Beacon because it really forces both teams to pay particularly close attention to the mid lane. The mid lane, in theory, should always be very important. Okay, it's the center of the map. It oops, offers the most rotation potential, right? And putting the Stygian Beacon there, right next to the mid lane, is a great way of focusing each team's attention on the mid lane. This also pr gives solo lane a reason to gank mid lane beyond just getting a little bit ahead again. All right. Ravan managed that slightly better than I did. I did my usual thing where I teleported to mid lane. Ravan ran to mid lane a lot of the times, which is why they tilted it towards solo lane a little bit more, right? To make it a little easier for a more victorious solo laner to more easily reach mid lane. Okay, now it wouldn't be a really strong motivation if it didn't give you something good. However, what it does give you, I wouldn't consider broken. It gives you increased structure damage and a very mild boost in your move speed. The move speed is 1% per beacon. There's only ever three beacons per game. So at most, you get a 3% move speed boost, which isn't really that much. It's a little bit of an edge, but more importantly is the structure damage. That's why they were so desperate to take that second beacon. That's why they were all there in force, fully restored. You can actually see, uh, I might be able to go back to this here for the second beacon. You can see with the second beacon, it's closer to here. You can see there, fresh, you can actually see as I'm coming in, the Scylla was a little too aggressive in that early part, but they are all right there, right? They're all pretty healthy. They really wanted, the only real reason they didn't succeed at that fight is because they were 
very far behind at that point. We had over twice as many team kills. We had almost 5,000 more gold than they did. They were just too far behind to make that work. They demonstrated good sound strategy here. Okay? They were aware of the importance of that second beacon. They just didn't have the golden experience. Now, some people will say, well, it makes it easier to snowball, and this match <laughs> kind of supports that. And to some extent, it does. All right, that is a bit of a mild flaw. I don't remember off the top of my head how much increased stru structure damage you do specifically. I will say it that might need to be tuned down a little bit. All right do slightly I, it should be like five percent i don't remember the percent off the top of my head i think it's 10 or 15 percent right now i i can't quite remember unfortunately but i would say five percent per beacon it actually might be five percent per beacon but yeah i can i can see where maybe a mild tweak in how much bonus structure damage the claiming team gets might be good it should still provide you with increased structure damage. You need some kind of worthy incentive to go after that. Otherwise, everyone's just going to ignore it. In order for that to do its job, which it is doing here, the Stygian Beacon is supposed to get both teams to really think about and force rotations, keep things dynamic, keep you paying attention. There is another thing that goes on here, and this is actually pretty well demonstrated by the totem, right? When the totem was first introduced, and actually consistently since it's existed, the totem has been pretty important because outside of the jungle camps, it's been a very huge focus, and it's something that an individual can take. So it's always been very important ever since the totem was introduced for junglers to lean on the solo lane because that totem benefit, that totem buff, goes across the whole team. It's just mana regeneration, but mana regeneration, if timed well, or arriving at the opportune time, can be very, very significant. That can make a really big difference. Okay? That can be very substantial. So, it was not unusual to see junglers sacrifice either the mid or the duo lane in favor of the solo lane to increase the likelihood that their solo laner could claim that totem and give their team a mana regeneration buff, which would help the team in the long run, because, of course, you'd have more mana available. The counterbalance to this is if you're sacrificing your other two lanes to focus too heavily on solo lane, that mana regeneration buff isn't going to matter, right? It, they're too weak to use that. So a really great jungler is going to be able to lean a little bit heavier on solo lane, but not so much that they sacrifice the well-being of their other two lanes. More significant to me than the potential for snowballing, which does exist, that always is going to exist, with any increased... Um, with any addition to the conquest map, you're always going to have that potential for snowballing that's inescapable. My real concern is that this is going to put a lot more pressure on junglers. There's a reason I didn't choose to be a jungler specifically here. I chose to be a solo laner. And there's a reason I've been talking a pretty decent amount about the Ratatosk gear. The Ratatosk gear did a really great job here. And it's important to remember that because right now, as the Conquest map is set up, the most important roles in the game, for Conquest, are, in order of importance, jungler, mid, solo lane. Prior to this, actually, let me actually phrase this this way. Prior to the introduction of the totem, all of the roles, in terms of their importance, were pretty variable. It depended upon the individual skill of the players at their role, which is why prior to this, if you had two players who were having a rough time, 
not necessarily because they were bad. Maybe it was an off day. Maybe it's a bad matchup. Whatever. You could the other three could carry them, right? Then the totem is introduced, and this shake, shakes things up, which is fine. I don't mind shaking things up. The totem was just the right amount of respawn and just the right amount of benefit to justify wanting it and justify pursuing that. That's fine. I actually like the totem. I think it's a really great addition. But what it did do that nobody's really addressed is it drastically increased... Well, I won't say drastically. It somewhat increased the importance of junglers and solo laners and mid laners. With just the totem, the, the role importance was jungler, solo, mid, and it was a very narrow margin. A good jungler could compensate for a bad solo or a bad mid. A good solo and mid could compensate for a bad jungler. Okay? <coughs> but it was always best to have a jungler who knew what they were doing. Now, with the Stygian beacon, jungler is... Having a good jungler is really significantly important because that jungler now has three goals, three predominant goals here. One keep their mid ahead so that way that their allied mid can keep the lane as dominated as possible to clear a better path for them take for your team taking the Stygian Beacon. So you want to lean on mid to help make sure your mid is doing well. Secondarily, lean a little bit on the solo lane to make sure that the solo laner is both, one, a high enough level to rotate to mid when the Stygian Beacon spawns, which is about 12 minutes, I think, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, it's 11 or 12 minutes. And two, to make sure that they're getting the totem, so that way the mid laner, who is the role most likely to need mana, gets that mana from the totem benefits. All right? Having a good jungler is tantamount, which is really unfortunate because when the totem was introduced, I mean, even before the totem, there was some predisposition of the smite community to blame their jungler on a loss. Okay, that's that's that was already something of a habit in the community beforehand. When the totem was added, that increased, but it was also pretty common and more accepted to also blame the solo laner as well to some extent. Now, with the introduction of the Stygian Beacon, you're going to see a lot of people, in the case of loss, blame the jungler. And, failing that, blame the mid laner. So, if you're watching this video, and you lose, it is still a team game. Sure, maybe your jungler didn't necessarily do everything that they should have, but they were not the only ones at fault. It is a team game. Don't go too hard on your jungler, or your mid, or your solo lane, because that is going to be a knee-jerk instinct, and at best, it will only be correct half the time. <coughs> at best. Okay? But, overall, I like this. I still want to play more with the Stygian Beacon, see how potentially bad the snowballing can get. Some of these matches snowball, some do not. I do suspect it will probably need a bit of a nerf in the area of structure damage. Okay. But. I want to experiment with it more before I say any more on the Stygian Beacon. But I like the Beacon overall. It does what they want it to do, which is increase player attention to mid lane. It forces great team fights in the mid lane, which is what you want to see. It's really great. It's cool. It's more interesting to play. It's more interesting to watch, which is what everyone wants. And overall, I think there is some good benefit. It's not too powerful on paper. In practice, I feel like it could be nerfed very slightly. Not much. Very small amount. Very bit of a nerf. 
but that's just my impressions so far. This was, incidentally, my second match. Alright, with the Stygian Beacon, post the newest update. The bonus update. Alright, I'd played with it before the bonus update, but I didn't release any video because I knew the bonus update was coming and I didn't want to say anything. Turns out the bonus update didn't change shit <laughs> about <laughs> Conquest. So my waiting meant nothing, so I apologize for that. That was a goof on my part. But this was my second post-bonus update game. I've played a few matches beforehand in Conquest prior to the bonus update. Having a head cold over the weekend did not help me play Smite consciously. <laughs> that's a conversation for another year, maybe. But that's my impressions so far, and that's why I like it. That's my thoughts on it. With that being said, thank you all very much for joining me. I will probably be doing one more of these that actually showcases the Titans fighting because that's worth talking about and we didn't get to see that this match, but that's what we have for now. But with that being said, thank you all very much for joining me. If you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions, or requests, please leave them down in the comment section below. And thank you all very much for joining me and have a great 24 hours.